Wow. Okay. Um, now I'm bitter. The Holy Spirit's given everybody my sermon. So, I, obviously God didn't think I could handle it myself. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Um, everybody heard I'm Bob. Did you check out my wife today? Did you see the little, uh, the little princess wave she gave when she got introduced? It's just... Like, She's so bougie. She's like, look at me. Hi. <laughs> true story. I don't want to like, true story, but uh, we have uh, like, a, like a, you know, garage door opener. And she goes out every morning and pushes the button and there's earwigs living in there. If you ever see an earwig, they're like those little long things look like they can kill you with the pinchers. So somebody told her that if you spray like Febreze and stuff on them, they'll go away. So if you want to come over to our house, we'll cook some hot dogs, and you can smell the nicest bugs in Warren because they live in my house. Yeah. <laughs> it worked. It works, he says. <laughs> um, let's, um, let's pray. Um, you know, I, I, Pastor Rose kind of uh, gave you a glimpse at my past. I didn't, that wasn't on the bio. That prior to, you know, um, I've been, been saved since I turned 29. Um, was a um, alcoholic, uh, and I um, was a crack addict. So. That's where I come from. So the fact that I'm standing here is just truly humbling. And, and I'll be honest, I have nothing to give you. I have nothing. Um, but the Holy Spirit that speaks through the Word, I'm going to do my best to speak what I think He gave me. He's given me this message for, uh, for a while. I'm excited. I feel like a horse ready for a race to get released, to, to kind of finally unleash this Word. Oh, God, without you, I think of Moses, Lord, when he, he prays, if you don't go with me, how would they even know you sent me? How would they know? And Father, I pray that they don't think of me tonight, but they think of you, that you would open up the word to us, Lord, and you would give us your heart. You would speak to us today because God is all about you. Oh, Holy Spirit, we desperately need you. More than, more than probably we even know. All the things you're holding back. All the things you're growing. All the things you're pouring out that we don't think of, God, that you're blessing us with. Father, we thank you. We pray these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. We say thank you. I give Jesus a thank you. But i tell you what. When you say thank you, thank him for something. Do it out loud. Say, Jesus, I thank you for my wife. I thank you for my job. Do it. Say thank you for something. Thank him for your health. Thank him for the fact you're sitting here. Thank him for the car that you have you can go to work. Thank him for the food you had this morning. Thank him because he's an awesome God. Amen. 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 So we're going to, I'm going to go to Isaiah chapter 41. Um, it's a, uh, just a quick ver couple of verses I want to just kind of talk to you about. I feel like God has something to say. So we're going to start. I would just read off there, I guess. Um, Isaiah chapter 41, starting at verse 8. He says, but you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I've chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend, I took you from the ends of the earth, from the farthest corners I called you, I said, you are my servant. I have chosen you, and I have not rejected you. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you by my righteous right hand. Amen. Lord, Lord we thank you for the word. We just thank you for everything you're going to speak to us through this. Um, one of the things... Uh, we are a blended family. Uh, when I was early, I, we have, um, I had two daughters, and Ruth Ann 
has a son and a daughter. We come together like the Brady Bunch. And uh, our kids are like all across the, come out all across the country. Most of them are in like that Virginia area. I have a daughter, daughter in Toledo. I have two daughters in Virginia. And I have a son up in the Maryland area in Baltimore. And my son, Rob, we, he has two daughters. And when the one, Ada, just a little pistol, and we go to cabins and stuff, and I don't do it. I'm, who's a puzzle maker? Anybody do puzzles in here? Uh, right? But Ruth Ann like, is like the, the puzzle person. They give her like the 5,000 piece puzzle, all one color, and she's out there in the, the kitchen, and she comes in like a half hour later, says, done. You know? And I'm like, oh, there, that was a quick $30, you know what I mean? Like she's just that, she likes to do puzzles. She's really good at doing puzzles. So when they go to the cabins, they buy puzzles. So here's little Ada. She's like two or three years old, and she's sitting on their lap, and they're doing the puzzle. And you could just see her looking, looking, looking. And she'd grab a piece and stick it and go. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, that might not fit. Did you, ever, did you ever feel that way? Like that piece of the puzzle, like I just don't fit. What, what, what we call that we call that, we call that like you're, you're marginalized. What happens is you, get, you feel like you get stuck on the outside of the stories, right? So when you do a puzzle, most people start with a frame and you do the framework. Then you have the pieces and there's these pieces on the outside. And sometimes you look at the piece and go, where in the world does this fit into the bigger picture? Where? where? And then later on you go, oh, there it is. That's what this is talking about. When he's talking about this, he's saying this. He's saying that I have gathered you. Think of, think of he, how he says this. I gathered you from the edge, the furthest corners. I called you. I called you from the places that maybe you don't fit. He's talking to his people who were like in captivity. And earlier before this, he's, he's talking to them and he's saying like, okay, you people with your idols over here and you people over here and this country, this, but my people. I'm calling you from the edge of the earth. My friends, did you hear him say that? You're my friend. I'm calling you from the edge of the earth. I'm calling you from a place of outside the margin, the place where you go, where do I fit in? As a drug addict, as a crack addict, when I got sober, people, I looked at myself and I go, where do I fit? Where do I fit in the world? I'm a, I lived in a, what they call a bando now. You know, I lived in an abandoned house with no electric. I got some people shaking their head like, yeah, I know what the bando is. You know, I lived in this old house with a shaky. I didn't fit. The, the mother of my children didn't want me around. My boss was threatening to fire me. I just didnn't fit. I needed something. I was on the outside. I wasn't in the story of life. I was on what they call the margins. And where do I fit? And I've asked that. So there was a night where I prayed. I was in a local establishment that served refreshments. <laughs> and I was, I was very well engulfed with my refreshments. And I remember seriously waking up. It was like, I, I don't know if I was in a blackout. I don't know what I was. But the lady said, hey, Bob, it's time to go. And I looked, and I was the only person in this place. And I walked out to the car, and that night, struggling. And, and I don't know if you ever said like a foxhole prayer. Did you ever get to a place where you're like, oh, please just... You know, if you do this, I'll do this, whatever. And I kind of laid my head on the steering wheel that night. And I'm like, if you're up there, big guy, I'm ready. Is there something up there for me? My goal was I just didn't want to hit anybody on the way home. My fear was I was always going to get in a car accident. It's like, the, like the only thing I didn't do, I destroyed a marriage, I destroyed a job, I was a thief, I was a liar, I, I, I've been arrested, I did everything but kill somebody. And I just did not want to be that guy. So if you just get me home safe, you help me drive home, keep me, in the, keep me between the lines. 
can you help me do that? And he did. He got me between the lines. He got me to the place where it says here, he says, you are my servant. I have chosen you and I have not rejected you. I want to bring you from the outside onto the inside and put you into the puzzle, put you into the piece and bring you in. And I was like, I can't believe he's going to do this. I mean, it was like you would think it was like, oh, did it happen overnight? It was a miracle and the sun shined and the birds started singing and the glory. I started walking across water. None of that happened. Nothing happened like that. But it was a lot of little things of being in faith and working, just doing daily stuff. And next thing you know, this voice started speaking to me. First time I walked in, he led me to an AA meeting. You know, I wasn't AA meeting. Why was I there? Yeah, that, that was for drunks. And I stood up and I said, hey, I'm, I'm Bob, I'm an alcoholic, because I know how to act. I could be in church, I know when to stand up and praise, and I know how to, I know how to fake anything. And I stood up and they said, Joe, I'm an alcoholic, and Steve, and I'm thinking, you guys are idiots. What are you doing this for? And, and I thought they were taking roll call, and I didn't want my boss to fire me. So I stood up and said, I'm Bob, and I'm an alcoholic, and I've ever heard a voice in my life Something said, yes, you are. Sit down and shut up. <laughs> I, I don't know. Seriously. And what do you do with a voice like that? What do you do when something starts to speak to you? What do you do when, when, when you meet Jesus face to face? How does that, how do you go back? And that's been the, the goal. I've been sober for 33 years. I know. Bless God. Thank you. Bless God. Seven years sober, I met Ruth Ann, and we started putting together. Ruth Ann, the one day, I, I, I work with kids. That's one of the things. But, uh, Justin Wagner, my real good friends of him, he was in my youth group, believe it or not, at one time. <laughs> now, picture Justin at 13 or 14. There you go. Yeah. So I had Justin running around my little youth group. He came to my house one day and said, hey, I just feel like... God wants me to do something in Youngstown. And we went to Youngstown, and he started what he called ROC. Yeah. And he asked me and Ruth Ann to start a youth ministry there. We did that for quite a few years. And what a blessing. And the one day I called, you know, you called a little kid, picture calling a 10-year-old going, hey, what are you doing? And the mom's like, who are you talking to? And I swear the kid turned around and said, I'm talking to my pastor. And the kids started calling me pastor. And I said to Ruth Ann, like, I'm not a pastor. And she looked at me and she said, well, maybe they're telling you something you need to hear. Amen. And they're telling you what you are. And I became a pastor. And I'm not that pastor. I'm the goofiest guy on the planet. If you're expecting, <laughs> you're, if you're expecting doctrine, you're probably not going to get much of it. You go, like Ruth Ann always says, you can fit the doctrine in a teacup. <laughs> but I love Jesus. So here's what I want to do. I, I wanna, so when he, when he talks about this, he says, but you, think of this, this is you. But you, O Israel, my servant. Think of the word servant. I want you to hear that today. Think of my servant, my descendants of Abraham, my friend. He's calling you friend. I took you from the ends of the earth, from the father's corners I called you. I just want to give like real four quick examples that I could think of, of people that were on the outskirts and then were called to the end, called in. One of the stories I was going to tell when I was like eight years old, I was riding home on the bus and it was going to be the Boy Scout night. We're supposed to be Halloweening and we're supposed to go to the Halloween party. And all the kids are like, we dress up like pirates. And I come home to my mom and said, well, we're going to this Halloween party night. We all dress up like pirates. And what did the mom say? If they all jump off a bridge, would you jump off a bridge too? So you're going as a shepherd. So there you go. Every kid's dream is to be a shepherd. So she dressed me up as a shepherd. And I walked into the Warndale Fire Department dressed up as a shepherd. And I think that's my life sometimes. I'm the shepherd dressed up in a room full of pirates. I just don't fit in. The first person I want to talk to you about is Jesus is walking through some, some area. Think of that, some area, just some area. She's walk, he's walking through. And Samaria is 
um, known because it's a mixed race. The Jewish people got caught up with the Sumerians. So it's a mixed race. The Jewish people didn't like that. They were just, we don't do that. So if you're a good Pharisee, if you remember the, the, the story of the, of the Good Samaritan, right, that, that messed them up because there are no Good Samaritans. So this area is not a place for Jews. Jesus is walking straight through. You're supposed to walk around. He's walking straight through. It's the hottest part of the day. It's noon. It's cooking. You can imagine being there. If you think of desert. 12 o'clock in the afternoon, sun beating on you. Jesus is walking. Dude's tired, thirsty. So he sits down. Now, I love the fact that Jesus was tired. He sends the 12 apostles to the local convenience store or something to go get food. I don't know where you get food in some area, but he said, run down to Taco Bell. I'm sitting here, get some food. If you know the story, you're kind of predicting this story. Um, it's in John chapter 4. Jesus is sitting there, and a woman comes to the well. Noon is important because noon is not a time you go to the well. You don't do work at this time. What this tells you is the fact that she come at noon is the fact that she was unclean. She felt unclean. And then there was like that caste system, like I'm clean, you're not clean. And, and, and today, if you get water from a well in India and you're unclean, and it goes over, just over the clean. They told us we were going to go on a mission trip, and the guy told us that don't touch the fruit because if they declare you unclean, you have to buy the whole cart because you're not allowed to touch. So this woman comes to get water, probably in the depth of shame because she knows who she is or what she is. And you guys can guess what she is. And she comes and Jesus looks at her. Here's a Jewish man, looks at her, says, I like a drink. <laughs> I don't know if it's snarky, but her response is, you know, I don't know if she's getting all snarky with him or not, but she's like, you're a Jew, dude. Like, we don't, we got beef, <laughs> you know, right? You know, we don't communicate. I don't talk to you. You don't talk to me. And Jesus says, I like a drink. And then they start talking about why she feels like she doesn't fit in their story about the men she's living with, about the people she lives with. I want you to see the disciples too in this because I want you to think about them, us. Because when you come and you got somebody talking to someone like that, they come back with their little sacks of whatever, Big Macs or whatever they had, and they come up and they looked at them and went, what? Why is this dude talking to this woman. chick? Yeah, woman. Right? Why? And Jesus has this nice conversation about, if you know me, you would want water from me. And she's like, well, what's wrong with this water? And she has this like big theological talk about why Jesus' water is better. But the key thing is, Jesus showed her how he, she fit into the puzzle. Amen. But I want you to see us. There's three people in the room. There's people like, we're servants. And the disciples are learning this. And they're learning, oh, he accepts people like that a lot. Then he comes out of the city of Jericho, and he's walking out, and, and they just had a conversation about who's the most important disciple. Hey, I want to sit on the right side. And the other apostles were like, what are you talking about? You want to sit on the right side. This is out of Luke. He says, what do you mean you want to sit on the right side of the throne? I want to sit on the right side of the throne. They're like, well, I'm the most important of the disciple. Why can't I? And Jesus is like, time out. Do you even understand what you're asking me? Are you, can you do what I'm doing? And they're like, man, well, I don't know. We're walking around healing people. I could do that. I'm, 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 I'm doing this. I fit in the puzzle. I'm one of the main pieces. I'm a corner piece, if you ask me. And they walk out, and I, I read the commentaries, and I disagree with them. But there's a man named Barnabas, and he's blind. He just can't see. And there's a lot of people in your life that don't fit in the puzzle because they just can't see. True. They just can't see what's going on. on. But they know, they hear about Jesus, but they start asking weird questions. They start yelling, right? They, they, you ever have that person? They don't look at that person next to you if that's that person, please. <laughs> You know, but if that's that person sitting right next to you, just keep looking at me, you know. We'll talk about them later at the dinner. 
But right, they're, they're, they're that person. But here's what I think happened in that story I think is important, is as they were walking by, he starts saying, who is that? Because can, he can hear two things happen, right? He's, he's got this cloak on, he's looking kind of forlorn, and he hears people, and he's like, ooh, people are coming by, I can beg, right? Can you give me something? And they said, it's Jesus. He's like, isn't that the guy that heals? And someone says, yes. So he's like, right? That's what I did that night. Nothing from nothing leaves nothing. Can you heal me? Do I fit in? Can I fit into the puzzle? So he starts calling to Jesus. The response of the disciples, I think, are fascinating. Sometimes our response is fascinating. I'm too busy. I'm too important. They go, the, the Bible says he, they rebuke him. Shh. He's too busy. The, the commentary say, well, maybe he was preaching, but it doesn't say that. It says he was just walking. Maybe he was teaching and walking. But there's a guy that needs something. They just saw some other healings. They just are arguing about who is the best. And my favorite part of this story is Jesus stops and says, like, who's doing all the yelling? And they're like, that guy. And he says, bring him over. He sends him over to make him come up. It says in the Bible that he throws his garment off. It's like throwing off that old and coming into the new. And he throws off the, his garment. And he runs over. And he's like, I'm here. You know, like, um, and Jesus heals him. Brings him in. I can see. And don't think physical, just physical here. Think spiritual. So you have the people in here or people that you know that feel ashamed of who they are. They, they just don't really see it. And I'm losing my earpiece. And the next one, similar story. Jesus is chilling, walking down the street. He's on his way to heal a little girl. Guy says, hey, I need you to heal her. And there was a woman who was sick. And she doesn't fit in. She's a lot in the temple. She has the issue of blood. So well, I don't know much about that. What I read is she has a, a monthly problem forever. Right. And she, because of that, she's not allowed to get, can you imagine? Because she's sick and because who she is, they can't, you can't get into church. You can't see Jesus. You can't come in to pray. You can't do what you need to do because of who you are. And that's the thing we do. You're an alcoholic. You're a homosexual. You're, you're this and you just can't. You can't come in. We just don't want you around us. You're unclean. And then the, the, the book tells me that when they walk by, they walk by Jesus, she sneaks up. And she says, oh, I can just get the corner of his garment. Now, interesting thing is the tassels. You know, remember the Jewish people wore the, the four tassels. The old tradition, extra biblical, said that the Messiah will have healing. If you look at the Old Testament, it says in Malachi that he'll have healing in his what? Wings. And the wings actually translates to like this Tanzania, which means tassel. So she knows the scripture says he has healing in his wings and she's like, you're the Messiah. That faith took her from the outside to the inside. Amen. Got her into the picture. And the apostles were like, what? Can you imagine? That's the thing. If we know your backstory, we'd be all like judging you, right? And that's not what we're supposed to do. We're servants, right? right? Who in here is on their own? Who come in here and said, I got this. I walked up today. I have no sin. Here I come to church, but they are just lucky to meet me, right? <laughs> Pray God. Right? Other than my wife, who's out there anointing bugs, yeah. The bug anointer of Warren. No, I'm seriously, right? Who, who in here doesn't have one of them problems? Who's that person that doesn't feel like they fit in the... Seriously, do you fit like you fit the, the puzzle? I didn't. And if you did, there's something egotistical about you, which brings me to my last one. My last die. Typical story. Jesus is walking. He's always walking. He's ignoring everybody. <laughs> but I think he does this with purpose. He's teaching the apostles. 
Remember, my, go back to my original text. But you, my servant, you're my servant. You, my servant, quit walking past people. Quit listening to them. So here's it, right? We all know this guy, Zacchaeus. Right? Right? We all talk about him being a little bitty guy. I think, I don't know. Yes, but you could throw stones at me after church. Probably not biblical, but here we go. I, I just feel like he came up short. <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> but I feel like, I feel like, here's a guy, right? We know what tax collectors, right? We all know the tax collector people. We know what they did, right? They used to go into the city, pay all your taxes. I would come in like, I'm Bob, here we go. Here's the money I'm paying everybody's taxes. Then all I had to get the money from you. So if the taxes for this group of people is $10,000, I'm going to get $30,000. And they, they, they learn to, to be brutal. They learn to be liars. They learn to be cheaters. They learn to, to be extorters. And that's, that's why this guy fell up short. He was a businessman that had a business that he wasn't running right. And deep down inside... He knew that he didn't fit in the puzzle. When he comes into church, something inside him says, like, you know something? I probably shouldn't have charged that, but I like the money. I probably shouldn't have did that because I like this. And he's that guy that feels like they don't fit because of what they do in their business. They're that guy. And he sneaks. He runs down the street Climbs up the tree. Remember, the people can't stand this man. He's a thief. He's a crook. He's that person, like, I have to go there, but oh my gosh. Did you ever go to a business and you feel like, oh my goodness, I got to go there? I'm not going to pick on car salesmen. Is there any car salesmen in the room? <laughs> we got, we seriously, we got our, 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 our basement redone. That's not an easy job, right? It's like, and it was like thousands of dollars. And they come in and they were like, you're, they were showing me pictures, like your whole house is going to cave in, and then we're going to pay this much. And then all of a sudden, they sort of call me lower in the price. I'm like, why don't you just come up with a price, Zacchaeus? But what they did is like, what, what happens is that person feels guilty. They know. Ezekiel says that like, they're like sheep, and they, they butt each other out of the way. They want all the water. Not only do they, 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 not only do they butt each other out of the way, let's think of some of the big stores. They want to just push the other businesses out of the way, but they want all the business. That's right. And then they drink the water and they muddy the water for everybody else. That's what Ezekiel says. That's what this guy's doing. And not only is he not part of the puzzle, he wasn't part of the puzzle because the people threw him away. When I was a kid, my mom did a puzzle, true story. I would, I would steal a couple pieces. <laughs> so when it was done, I can go in and get the glory of finishing it. So I would hide five pieces. True story, did it. That's what this guy did. Stole the pieces for himself. And then he ran down the street, climbed up the, th the tree, just to get a glimpse of what glory is. Just to get a glimpse of what God can do. I don't think he really believed that he can fit. He just wanted to see. Just like Bartimaeus. I'm blind, I want to see. I'm a thief. And Jesus walks by. And it's cool. Jesus stops right at the bottom of the tree. Looks him eyeball to eyeball. I always say when you're talking to guys, mustache to mustache. We're talking mustache to mustache here. I'm going to look you in the eye and tell you what's up. And he says, I want to have dinner with you. And he's like, can you imagine me? Can I have dinner at your house? Absolutely. What did the disciples do? They got angry. All the people go, he... Why are you talking? How does a person get saved if you don't talk to them? How does a person come to Jesus? When, when, do we, when did the church pick up the attitude that they have to get clean before I can talk to them? When is it their job to clean themselves? If they would have told me, Bob, you can't come into a church until you get sober and get clean. Dude, I've been trying it for years. I couldn't stop smoking crack if you... Paid me a million dollars. You know what I'd do with a million dollars? I would waste. I mean, did you see it? Do you hear it? 
And I heard the prophecy this morning from up here. And what she was saying is, God is saying to you, if you're sick, if you feel like you're coming up short, if you're blind, I want you. I got a place for you. And if you're that person, I, I, God bless you. I'm a, I'm a street guy. I like working with kids that are hurting. Amen. I like working with people. We went out and had uh, Eaton Park the other day. I'm not mentioning no names, but somebody reminded me of the day I, I, years ago I, I played Veggie Tales for this person. <laughs> and then she started, she, she started singing Veggie Tales tunes. So I've had Veggie Tale earworm every year since Wednesday night. Because I put it, I, I taught her to play her kids. What, how long ago? Uh, 20, 20 she put herself out there, not me. <laughs> but do you hear that? And I'm not here, like I said, I'm, I'm, that, I'm, that, I'm that evangelistic heart. But if that's you, if you feel like you don't fit, man, I, I, I just, we just want to pray for you today. Yeah, and, if, and, if it's, and if it's you, you're going like, I really want to be more like Jesus and and, and just, I need to maybe repent because the way I think. Because it's hard. I work, I work every day with 20, I've got 26 guys that are heroin, needle using heroin addicts and alcoholics. And the stories I hear are just unbelievable. They just put out the, th the, the quarterly, um, Trumbull County put out their quarterly things, uh, qu the quota for alcohol and drugs. And we've had 53 heroin deaths last quarter. And they said there's 12 pending. Our record is 56. If just four of them were, uh, were heroin overdoses, we will, the last quarter, we would have lost more human beings to fentanyl than we have lost in the last 20 years. These people are dying. These people are dying. Our children are suffering. Our friends are sick. They're on the street corners crying out, and some of them don't even realize it. Some of them are trying to sneak up and just touch Jesus the best way they can. They just don't realize it. We need, we are the servants of God. We've been called. Before this, he was talking about, my favorite, one of my favorite verses in the Bible was um, Jeremiah when he says about the, uh, the, the people following, like you know, these idols, and people watching, whatever. I'm not going to throw idols out there because I don't want to convict anybody. And some things are good. But these idols, he says, it's like a scarecrow in a cucumber patch. They just don't move. Is that a great example? You're like a, like your idol like a, cu a scarecrow in a cucumber patch. Does nothing. It needs to move. We have to move it. The living, we said that, we heard that in the praise. We're serving a living God. Why does he use us? I don't know, but it's awesome, isn't it? And when you start to tell people about Jesus, when you start to love people, that's when the power of God comes. It comes when I get to, get to move. When I, when I go in the, to my group in the morning and I go, God, and I always say that, that silly prayer in my car, like, if you don't go with me, how they know there's something. And I, hear, I do amazing things, things that I can't do on my own. The voice of God tells me to whispers, the whispers of God. I woke up one morning and I... I was like, I was like almost afraid to tell Ruth Ann, like, I just could not stop thinking of this lesbian woman. And I'm like, what am I, creepy? Like, I just can't quit thinking about her. I can't stop thinking about this woman. So I started praying for her. I went to work that day, and I'm sitting in my office, and the woman that was my client got triggered, and she wanted to go get high. And they said, she's outside, all packed and ready to go. And I walked out to give my best nickel speech. And she's like, Bob, I don't want to hear it. I need to go get high. And I'm like, you, nothing I can say to stop you. Nothing. And I said, okay. I, after I gave her my best shot, I turn around, who's standing right here? Packed and ready to go. This woman. And I walked up. I said, you know, wow. God spoke to me today, friend. And God wants to bring you into the picture. God, God spoke to me today. And she looked at me funny. And I was sitting at my desk about a half hour later, and I hear, she's back. She's back. And it wasn't, it wasn't my girl, unfortunately. God, God blesses her. But it was this girl. 
And today, last week, I walked into an orientation meeting for new people. And who's sitting there with a tag, name tag on, getting ready to work for us? Is this woman, and I walked up to her and I said, you never would have guessed, would you? She's like, no. Oh, the things that Jesus does. Amen. Oh, the things that God can do for you. So I'm getting, I'm, I'm done. I'm going to get ready to close. I'm, I'm closing a book. I'm closing it. That's the book. Uh, but I do. Father, I, I, just, I, I, I just pray, Lord, that, that, your, that your, your heartbeat was felt today. That, that they saw you in those stories. They, they, they heard you being talked by Isaiah. That Isaiah was proclaiming your word, proclaiming your health, proclaiming your life. And Father, as the, uh, the team, the prayer team comes forward, as the, 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 prayer, the Mercy in Action prayer team comes forward, I pray that if you, if, if you need prayer, if you want to talk to me, if you need prayer today, don't, don't sit there, please.